Let's make a start. So this evening, we are sitting down with Andy Doherty from AdLib. Andy is the MD of AdLib and has been a major part of the We Make Events campaign, uh, starting with his video that he did with James Gordon and Coy for Plaza right back in July, I think it was. Um, Let's bring Andy in. We can say hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. You've got a glass of wine. You've got your fire in the background. You're you're good to go. Yeah. What more could one want? Well, this is it. This is it. How have you been? You've been well. Amazing. Um, yeah, I've been good, mate. I mean, obviously, I mean, mine's been kept busy, which is good between obviously the good ship ad lib and uh, all the we make event stuff that we've been collectively doing so yeah. from the point of view i haven't had time to stew on things things have been yeah pretty good in that sense that's good so yeah. let's let's go right back to the beginning so mm-hmm. you you're a liverpool lad born and bred uh-huh well what was it like growing up in liverpool back in the in, in the 30s it was all in black and white um <laughs> It was obviously 60s Liverpool. I don't remember much of, um, other than the fact it was it was a, a very industrial city then. It was the end of the docks and all that kind of stuff. And then the depressions of that went through into the 70s. And I really start to remember doing things from the back end of school more so than anything else. But Liverpool, it was a it was a nondescript place. It had come out from. I didn't really know much about the Beatles stuff, if you know what I mean. And then that yeah. was obviously what was making the city great um, regarding a musical background and the whole Mersey Beat thing that went alongside that. Um, but for me, that's not really a memory. That was just something that happened in the city. Yeah. Um, when you got to the sort of 70s, as I was growing up, as getting to the teenager side of things, I suppose at that point, uh, the whole Mersey Beat thing had died. The city was at its lowest ebb. Um, and as that trundled through into the 80s, um, we had the whole Toxtus riot thing going on in 84. And in some respects, that was the lowest point. And it was from that point when, really speaking, if you, th- you can almost link it back to Lord Heseltine coming up and seeing how bit bad the city was that investment started. Yeah. Um, and it's really in the last 15 to 20 years that the city, has, well, 10 to 15 years, that it's really reinvented itself. So it was just a quite a depressing place back then in all fairness <clears throat> yeah what well, what was there to do as a as a young young lad in liverpool i'm, guess, I'm guessing not not a huge amount back then well I, again I, when i was again teens i did play a fair bit of tennis when i was in in my teens and footy um but you know, other than that the gig thing didn't really hit me until um late school when a friend of mine a guy called roy martin um, who is uh, went on to be and well, was at the time and went on to be and still is uh, an incredibly successful session drummer. Um, but when he was at, uh, he was a mate of mine, played footy with him at school. Um, but he was playing in bands at weekends um, from the age of about 15. So I just went, literally went along and helped move some gear around and was what you would call your classic roadie. Yeah. Um, you know, hair down your back and, uh, and, uh, and lumping gear all over the place. Uh, and yeah, it was fun. It was a laugh. It was something you did, and it was something you know that I can I, I did for a, a fair period of time. When, when did that kind of start to become your job? Because am I right? You you trained as an electrician. Yeah. Originally. So what happened was when when I miserably failed my lower six at school and at my mock A levels, and I thought I've either got to work incredibly hard to get decent grades, or I'll go and get a job. Going to get a job seemed the uh, easier option at the time. So I went for a couple of interviews, and uh, this was one of them in 17, and I, I, I basically applied for either uh, an administrative job in the council or uh, an apprentice and electrician, and I got the electrician's role. And the whole logic at the time was that that will help the band, because at that point I was working with the band, again, Roy and a guy called the, the people in that band at the time, 
where by Roy Martin, who I mentioned, a guy called Chris Lay, who later went on to be in a band called The Icicle Works. Um, and then two other characters, John Corner, who went on to do a successful film production company uh, and a really good guitar player by the name of Alan Redmond. Um, and as I say, they're your mates, they've got bits of gear. I was the only one with an income there, all at college and uni, because they were all dead clever. Um, and I just wound up then buying bits and pieces of equipment and then wound up with a whole load of junk by the time I was 23 that glued together and went out and did a few gigs with. And yeah. then at that point, um, I've been a spark from when I was 17, so doing local gigs in the evenings, um, weekends away, and then uh, at 23, made redundant, went on one of those fantastic government enterprise allowance schemes, uh, which was around in 1984, which was um, 40 quid a week for a year. Uh, and that was the instigator to um, start the nightmare I've now created. Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, so we, we kind of, I kind of, uh, that's how I, how I initially started it, just by gigging at weekends with various different bands. And then from about 85, 86, I started picking up residencies as the house PA in some of the small, really small Liverpool venues uh, yeah. at that time. Uh, and just pretty much working and mixing with every Liverpool band as, as there was. Um, and there was a significant amount of them around then as well. I was going to say, Peter's already mentioned um, Delamitri as one of the bands that Adlib have um, done production yeah. and sound for. Can can you name some of the others that that you've worked with over the years? There was there was loads of bands through the through the um, uh, the eighties that were all Liverpool based. I mean, one band I particularly worked with, I was very proud to work with, who you've probably never heard of was a Liverpool band called The Real People, who were a very indie style band. Again, the two main characters were two brothers, uh, Tony and Chris Griffiths. And to this day, they're still one of the greatest pair of songwriters I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And so much so that um, uh, the first three Oasis albums that you will hear are pretty much complete rip-offs of their songs because they worked together a lot at the beginning of that career. And Liam and Noel, would go and watch the real people. They supported the real people on numerous occasions. Again, two brothers, two brothers. And if you actually cast your mind back to the first single that Oasis did was Supersonic, which was actually recorded in Liverpool, in Lark Lane, in what was then called the Motor Museum, the recording studio there. And they had a kind of idea for a song, but they didn't really have it. Phoned um, Chris and Tony up of the real people. They went down, more or less wrote the song for them. And it's almost, they put the guide vocal down, it's almost been emulated in a Scouse accent, if you listen to that. And also, Tony will have credit on that single for backing vocals. But well, yeah. I've got numerous desk tapes somewhere um, of the real people from 89 to 91, when they were the first band I went to the States with, first band I went to Japan with, first band I did quite a lot of stuff with. As I say, they signed a major deal to a major label when that wasn't cool. And everyone else was signed to um, uh, all the independents and so on and so forth. And um, long and short of it, they um, wound up in a situation where they were keeping, you know, everyone was saying to the real people, look, you need to, you need to have a few words with, with, the, with the lads there. You know, they're, they're mainly your songs. They're mainly your songs. No, they're fine. They'll look after us. They're fine. They'll look after us. And um, as it transpired, nothing they didn't really get looked after for the two or three first albums. And I am led to believe that uh, allegedly there was an out of court settlement um, after the third album, which uh, afforded them to buy the recording studio that they have. And I think if we remember correctly, the fourth Oasis album was the uh, <coughs> concept album. Um, so there's a lot of people in Liverpool have a lot of awareness of the real people and who they are and what they were. After that, for me, I think the first major artist I picked up was, um, was uh, Texas. Um, and I think I did pretty much every live Texas show from 93 through till probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, and along the way, having mixed Texas, it was Justin from Delamitri, who um, was actually guesting in one of their Barrelland shows on uh, Christmas Eve. And um, he liked what I was doing. Uh, and then he asked me to come along and start mixing the Delamitri stuff. So. For the first couple of years, they actually dovetailed really, really nicely between mixing Texas and then Delamitri. And then the point came where I couldn't do both. And Dave Kay, 
uh, one of my nearest, dearest friends and director uh, in Adelaide, he took on doing Delamitri and unfortunately did a better job than me and I never got it back. <laughs> <him anymore. laughs> Am I right in saying that Texas, you, you were at um, uh, Edinburgh Castle, weren't you, on um, the Millennium? Yeah, that was a great night, that. So that was... Um, so we'd, we, uh, the forecourt of Edinburgh Castle was a TV show that Texas were doing that went out about 10.30. And then I managed to get an escort down the hill, um, not that kind of escort, it was a police one, <laughs> down the hill to go and do um, Delamitri, who we'd sound checked earlier in the day. So Delamitri were playing on the bandstand uh, and Texas were, were doing the, um, the actual castle forecourt. So you, you were running through all the fireworks when you were saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was great. Um, yeah, that was that was a that was a night. I mean, most people are going to remember where you were on the millennium of an age, um, but to be able to go and do two of your favourite bands that you've worked with for so many years at that point um, yeah. on a night as special as that that was that was one of those nights that definitely stick out. Yeah. As was as was um, 1995, a gun gig. I used to mix gun as well. All the Glaswegian bands for some unknown reason, and um, they were doing the end of their tour and the last night of their tour was Shepherd Bush Empire, which also happened to be the day of the FA Cup final when Everton were playing Man United. And uh, I had tickets for the game. We'd finished Rock City the night before. We got to the hotel at five in the morning uh, on the Saturday. I had the band in sound checking at 10. So I could go to the game in the afternoon where we beat United 1-0 and then I had a great gig in the evening as well. So that was another memorable night. That was fun. <laughs> Funny you mentioned Everton because I've, I've got a question here from Keith going, Andy, you're famous for being an avid Chelsea fan. <laughs> I'm, 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 th I'm guessing he got the wrong blue uh, football club. Yeah, yeah. No, no, definitely not. No, no. Season ticket blue. Actually, here's an interesting story. I don't know if I told you this one before, but I was number one this year. I was a number one hit this year. This is true. Me who can't sing a note of anything ever. But to go back to 1985, Everton uh, were a, a brilliant team then. We won pretty much everything. And I played football with uh, a team called the Mersey Boots. And the Mersey Boots were made up of a load of 60s, 70s bands, like Sir Billy Kinsley, who was in Liverpool Express and the Mersey Beats before that, um, Brian Rawlins, and a load of other local entertainers, comedians and everything. And what we used to do was every Sunday morning, We'd go and play a match against a local pub, then all these artists would play in the afternoon or do something in the afternoon and just raise a little bit of money locally for a charity connected to that pub. And they were quite famous at the time and uh, for doing what they did. And Everton were that successful and that busy. They'd had a song written for them by um, Bill Kinsley and Kenny Parry uh, out of what was Liverpool Express at that point. But they never actually had time to come in and record it. So... Back in Amazon Studios in the day, which was up in Kirby, which then later became Parsley's, um, they had to get a team of people in to record this song. So they wound up getting the Mersey Boots to go in, because, again, just a gang of fellas. It's going to sound, you're not going to be able to know whether it's the real team or not. So we all went in, sang this song. Obviously, like every football song, nothing ever happens to it. It gets played before the game, and that was it. Yeah. So anyway, this year, Everton signed a guy called um, James Rodriguez, who has got his own hits of about 28 trillion million in Colombia, where he's from. When he signed for Everton, this song went out there, and then over this period of two weeks was the biggest selling or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't get involved with media music. But whatever it is, had the most hits, the most sales for a two-week period. So I've actually had a number one sing, and I can't sing a note. Results. <laughs> you're you're now famous in Colombia. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not for those reasons though. <laughs> and let's go back to um, Adlib. So tell yeah. tell me what what does Adlib do? Because obviously, obviously you do sound. Well, initially, it started out initially as all as all audio, obviously, because that was my history, my background, and everyone who was getting involved with us back in the early days, people like Chris Leckie, who we still do stuff with, Rob Isherwood, who's now over at Manchester, and then, um, you know, Dave Jones, Phil Stoker, Dave Kay, uh, Hass, the team, all the team that got involved with us, we were all audio boys, not thinking about anything else. So it started off as audio, and then as time moved on, I kind of, um, like a lot of things, a lot of, of, of ad-lib, it's, it's, 
I do a lot of things not based on wouldn't that be a really, really good, clever business idea. I kind of do it on, well, what happens if the money dries up on that? We need another income stream. We need to be looking at this. We need to be looking at that. And then eventually lighting got bolted on and that got bolted on in a sort of small way for a very long period of time. Um, and it grew very, very slowly, whereas the audio was growing rapidly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, we, we probably started dabbling in video stuff from um, early 2003, 2004. Excuse me. And uh, but again, on a very, very small level. Uh, but we had a little bit of a footprint and a foundation in it. And then obviously over the last four or five years, the investment that's gone into lighting and video, particularly video in the last two years, mm. um, has been immense. Um, you add on top of that rigging. So a lot of what the company does now is, is sort of 360 solution between cameras, video wall, um, uh, lighting, audio. Uh, and then there's other sides to the business as well. Um, installations, we do a lot of um, installation work. Again, a lot with the building contractors and the um, specialists like your charcoal blues and your um, Arabs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then we also do a lot of install work, which we which we have a different teams for that deliver into your schools and your churches and, and your, your restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it, it's got quite a broad um, angle on anything to do with production. But obviously one of the big differences with us as well is um, we're very proud of the team that we have and all the guys who are part of that team and quite unique in the fact that we employ uh, a lot of our own engineers and technicians, which I actually believe moving forward with the way I think things are going to pan out, uh, I do think a lot more companies will wind up employing technicians moving forward because I don't think it's going to be as favorable potentially as it has been for a lot of the freelancers. Yeah. So I think that I think there's going to be a bit more of a shift towards that as things move forward. And you, you make your own speakers and flight cases and everything on, on site as well, don't you? So it, it's a whole kind of custom package that you can deliver. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the flight cases in particular, I mean, that part of the business, if we go back like, even only five or six years, it was 50-50 between external clients and uh, our internal consumption, if you like. Whereas now, uh, I'd say 90% of what we do is internal. Um, which is all the packaging stuff. And 10% is when you say we make speakers, we do a lot of smaller product um, for, again, the bars, the restaurants, the, the, the churches, et cetera, because we feel that the product that we can make holds greater value than um, some of the more, um, shall we say, prestigious names in that marketplace. Uh, and we don't feel that you get what you need out of the really cheap boxes. So our boxes are probably cost priced the same as some of the leading brands, um, but actually um, the way we control them and the, and the way we need to uh, process them is a lot, lot cheaper. So just looking at the questions that are coming in. So Nikki's just asking, in your work life, what, ev what every day do you enjoy the most and why? Oh, okay. Um, well, that's, that hasn't happened for at least 10 months now. But what I get, obviously, I used to love mixing bands. There's nothing, it's almost like when I stopped doing that, it's like a footballer hanging, you know, hanging his boots up in some respect. So I've really missed mixing bands. And I started moving away from it the day when it started moving from analog to, uh, to digital. Yeah. And um, I've struggled with the new technologies since then. And they frustrate me more than help me. Um, so I've done less and less, but my actual love was mixing live bands. And I think the biggest kick I get these days is seeing some of the talent that we get, that we employ, some of the young guys who are coming through and you watch that and you nurture that. And you may have had a little bit of input into how they've developed um, as either people or engineers, because this is one of the very few industries where it's not just about your skill set. Your skill set has to include who you are as well. So, you know, in a little bit of development of characters and personalities alongside, um, you know, I obviously, I can't teach anybody anything to do with, with lighting or video or, or even audio these days in some respects. But what I can do is teach them professionalism because yeah. that's not something that people come out of college or university with because it, it's very much an unknown quantity unless you've been in the industry for a while. And it's a magic word. If you understand it, you'll know what I mean. If you don't understand what I'm saying, then you've maybe got a little journey to look at, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
that's my belief anyway. So obviously we so we talked about obviously ad lib kind of pre March 2020, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Obviously March March hit. Mm-hmm. COVID nineteen kind of slapped the industry around quite a bit, and we've we've had to change quite a lot. And you put out a video with um, James Gordon and with Koi for Plaza for the We Make Events campaign. Can you just talk about how that video came about and how your involvement came about in We Make Events? James Gordon's fault. Um, you know, prior to that, actually, um, it was Peter uh, and Keith from um, Plaza and Keith from Aspect Club who sort of had spoken to me uh, initially about, you know, where's this going? And, uh, in fact, in fairness, I'd spoken to Peter first and then Andy Lenthal at PSA about, you know, our sector needs to be thinking about this. We need to be coming together. We need to. And they, to be fair, there was a lot of stuff already going on that I didn't know about or most people didn't know about because they had been really, really good. Um, I'd mentioned this, and then not long after, I get a phone call back uh, from Peter and from Keith sort of going, um, you know, we need to take this further. What, you know, can you help out? And then at that point, I think I introduced James, um, so he couldn't escape and get away with it. Uh, and then a whole load of people came on side after that. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that has been brilliant out of all this negativity is the team of people that, I've met on the We Make Events thing that I would probably yeah. never have wet before, uh, wet, met before, um, which has been, um, that's been great. That has been good. So I think you know, my involvement came from being asked and uh, being in a position where um, these days I can't do anything because I do know people. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like uh, I'm somewhat limited within our sector, but I do know people who can make stuff happen, which is good. I'm, I'm guessing at that point we kind of, we were expecting it to be kind of three months and we'd be back back to normal. And then obviously we weren't. And yeah. um, you obviously had to, as the MD of Plaza, uh, MD of Plaza, MD of Adlib. Sorry, so, Peter. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you, you unfortunately had to make people redundant. Um, and you, you put a Facebook post out, which... Um, I think really showed people that, you know, as an MD of a company, you're not just this guy that sits in an office that, you know, MDs do have a heart. They do care about the the people that, that they work with. I I just want to read out a section of it. And you, and you put hello production world. I've been on Facebook for many years and never ever posted anything. In normal times, I feel social media creates more negative effects than positive. But in this instance, I believe I have to promote a message through it. Monday, the 27th of July was one of the worst days of my life, having to serve notice of potential redundancy to 67 of my friends. I still feel physically sick and unsurprisingly, I'm struggling to sleep. And you go on to talk about the fact that we're just seen as people that our roadies just pushing flight cases around and you talked about how much the industry was worth at the time and the growth of our sector uh up until 2020 can you just can you just elaborate on on what that was like so that must have been heartbreaking well i think um there's a few things that came out of that i mean first of all the redundancy process is the most inhumane process for an employee and an employer that I could imagine. I've never had to even venture down that route before. Yeah. Um, and and that, that was something that was horrific. Um, and these the people that you wind up employing in this industry, it, it takes forever to find them. They're not somebody who will literally walk in one day and go, I want a job. You know, you can go through a million CVs, you'll go through a whole load of work experience opportunities, and to pick the team that you pick takes forever. And Mm. they are a precious um, group of people. And what you find is that the majority of them have similar mindsets. So, and and to, to, to actually put that case in point right, quite a few of them already have gone off now, got jobs in other sectors, and will not be coming back. Because 
other sectors have more money and other sectors, you're not getting phone calls 24 seven. So they're moving off into other areas and people, other employers are going, these guys are great. They care, they're courteous, they're polite, they're pleasant. Um, excuse me. So that's it. They're, they're, they're gone and they're out of the sector, which also, I mean, the one thing that really stuck, stuck with me was out of the 67 redundancy notices that were made, 55 were made redundant and 34 sent in emails after they were made redundant to thank them for the opportunity that they had and put no blame in our, in, in, and when you know that, you kind of know that they were always the right people, you know? Yeah. So it, it was incredibly difficult. Nobody in, I don't believe in any business in our sector is just a commodity. You know, you know everyone's first name, you know the families, you know they've just moved house, they've just rented one over there, they've just bought one here, the mortgage has just come in. That bank loan's only been frozen for three months, not six months yeah. now. They're really struggling. They're not just a number. That whole redundancy process is based around massive, massive organisations who are getting rid of employee number 1,233 and 235, not like yeah. Joe or Natalie or Ryan or, you know, or any of the team that we may have had to let go. So it was, one, horrific because of the process, and mm. two, horrendous because of the people and the problem is is we still haven't been able to see any of these people to how are you doing what's going on you know you you know you need that social element as well which has been taken away from everybody not just our sector but our sector is a social sector as well so it's a double whammy really so mate it was it was it was hard to deal with and you know i wasn't dealing with the nitty-gritty behind the scenes stuff you know there's other directors and and senior players in our place who were having to deal with the, the actual nitty gritty of it as well, which in some respects is even worse. So what John Hughes had to deal with, Dave Kay, Chris Bird in the accountant department, Kathy and Geddon in HR from our place, what those people had to deal with um, on, on the, the administrative side of it and dealing with a lot of the initial questions, but it's horrible. Absolutely yeah. horrible. You, you were saying that, you know, there's, and I, I, I've, went through it myself as an employee and you know you do you have you have all these questions and you you can't you can't answer them because mm -hmm. there are protocols and processes that you have to go through yeah. and you just sometimes you just want to put an arm around someone and go it'll be all right um and you you just it takes all the human element out of it there's, there's so many things where we could have helped people but we were warned by our solicitors at the outset of the process that it's going to be a painful six weeks. You're not allowed to do this and you're not allowed to do that. And the, the example they gave or the reason they gave, I kind of got, which was, you know, you could have somebody sat at home six months after all this has happened who still hasn't had a penny, who gets that phone call that says, you made redundant under the coronavirus crisis. Well, maybe we can help. Did your company do this, this or this? So you've got to be absolutely squeaky clean you've got to do yeah. you've got to follow protocol you've got to follow process and you know even having to do that in some occasions when you know you could have put an arm around some people and taken their pain away instantly or advised them to go and do something else immediately who were still holding on it was just ridiculous you yeah. know it, it, it would definitely be something moving forward that you know i think should be looked at not from from our sector's point of view but in general that whole process Mm. Let, let, let's move forward so you know obviously we know that our industry will get back on its feet it, yeah. it's too important to society and humanity to to lose i know i know that's it that sounds a bit presumptuous as i as i said it then but you know we've we've, we've always told stories as yeah. as human beings we've always sung songs we're always going to be doing that yeah. Where where do you see the industry going in 2021, 22? Uh, I, I think it'll come back fast, if I'm being honest. I think some things uh, may be a little bit slower, um, depending on the sectors that we're in. So, for example, you know, theatre, for argument's sake, it takes a lot longer to rehearse a show, get the staff in, the technical thing, the costs of it. It's a lot, lot longer. Rock and roll, it's really as long as it takes the band to rehearse and the ticket sales to be sold. And if we think at the minute, anyone and everyone is desperate for a piece of entertainment, mm. then I think regarding getting tickets sold isn't going to be uh, a huge and massive issue. Um, the biggest issue is, uh, at the moment, as, as, as you're aware, 
is that you know promoters are nervous about putting shows yeah. out there at the minute because if for some reason there's another bout of COVID that's going to stop shows happening, and we're talking ideally, you know, May, June, July potentially, um, because they may lose everything to put into it. So obviously, one of the things that we make events is looking to help fight for is um, a COVID back, a COVID insurance scheme. So an insurance program that if something goes wrong related to a COVID cancellation, people are covered. And they've done it for the film industry. So I'd like to think they could do it for our industry as well. But I think if that happens, then uh, I think that the return could be pretty quick. And when it does return, when eventually it is allowed, whether that be June or September, it will come back massively. And we are going to have skill shortages. We're going to have equipment shortages. Um, nobody can tell what state at this moment in time this supply chain is going to be in. Yeah. Whether you're ad lib, PRG, um, SSE, Solatech, you know, yeah. any of them. I was going to say, we, we, we know that, you know, thousands of people have, have lost, left the industry. They're, they're not the kind of job so you can just go down to the job center and go, right, I want a lighting technician, I want a sound technician. You know, the, these guys and girls have been training for at least 10 years in their, in their profession. You can't just replace them overnight. No. So uh, how, how, how do we go about doing that? What, what do you think the answer is? Um, I, that's a, that's we don't know. I mean, I think you know there's a long term answer for that, but that's not going to help in the short term. The short term is, um, you know, it, it is trying to preempt when the industry is going to come back, and hopefully trying to find out as early as possible who is still on site, who you can get in, who is going to be available. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of engineers and technicians who will be desperate to get back. But yeah. aren't going to be desperate to come back and do one tour because they might have another six months off again. They're going to want to know, right, this sector's back in now. I actually believe when it is back in, that will be the case, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But if you're a freelancer and you're offered a tour now for, say, May, um, and you've got nothing likely to hit your diary at this moment in time till potentially, say, December or January, you're not going to take it if you've got another form of income at the minute. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people will jump back, um, but it, I, I don't think everybody will. And I think, you know, training is going to be a huge part of what moves forward, which then leads us into the conversations we've had around education and trying to get that a little bit more fit for purpose for our sector. Um, but that's another whole story. Which I, 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 I was going to say already. I can't even see who's on the call, but I can hear um, you groaning. I, I, I know. I know. Mean, me and you are both very passionate about education. Yeah. We've we've had long chats offline about yeah. about the education sector. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I suppose you know, brief, briefly touching on it. Obviously, we are going to need to train up more um, technicians and more people. Um, and we need to make sure that they are trained to a high standard to be able to come into our sector. So it is something that, as an industry, we need to have a look at. And, you know, there, there needs to be some collaboration between education and the industry to make that happen. So I think, you know, I know, I know both myself and a few others on, on here are already looking at, at that. And I think that's that's something that is very important to make sure that you know the students that are graduating are at, you know there are jobs for them in the sector to start with, and that they are in a they've been prepared to come into the industry. You know, I think that it's important to kind of start at the bottom and work your way up and get an understanding of of how the industry works. I think without going going into it, I mean, my first thing is there needs to be a little bit more honesty and integrity from from education as to what these young people are coming into. Yeah. Um, and I find that the majority of people who've been successful in our place, the youngsters, they, they knew what they were coming into anyway. They knew more than the tutors in most cases, and they just, in a lot of cases, you know, education has been a route to find the likes of ourselves. That route didn't exist in my day, or probably even your day, to be fair. You just kind of, I love that, I'm going to do it, you know. And and nowadays, education's in the middle of it. I yeah. would say 
in some cases a uh, a hindrance to those people who desperately want to get there who think they have to and in other cases uh it works really really well because it gives them something to think about that they maybe didn't have before that actually then works for them um but those who really know what they want to do at 15 16 they will all pretty much succeed in this yeah um because they know what they're coming into I'm, I'm just looking at the questions and I've just realized that I was looking at the same four questions over and over again and that I hadn't actually scrolled. So let, let's let's have a look. Uh, what have we it's uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, if anyone's asking that question. It's um, it's a, a, a Villa Maria. Um, so, yeah, all highly recommended. Excellent. Excellent. That's that's one with that we've got covered off. <laughs> um, uh Gavin, you put, uh, it's truly inspiring how you look after your people from the very first getting into the industry right through their career. Do you have any stories about someone you've trained up that's gone on to make you proud? Lots. Um, I'll pick a few. Um, so uh, a young lady by the name of Laura Davis, who was one of the first um, young girls, shall we say, to get wrapped up in this industry again. My old, we used to go and do a gig a year free of charge where we took a bucket load of gear into my old school, which was Gattaca Comp. And we did, uh, basically, we got them to organise a school band night, put a load of bands on. We'd do a production day, put a few lights up, put a PA in, explained what each bit was and engaged, um, I'm going to say the kids because I can't be bothered saying the correct the politically correct title of young people. Uh, and we got the kids as engaged uh, as they possibly wanted to be. And um, I would say for a period of time, we got two or three youngsters out of Gattaca every year who came on, wound up doing some work experience stuff with us. And there's still probably now 20 in the company who've got, who came from Gattaca as a, as a school thing. Laura in particular, um, Laura, she came as this sort of like young 14-year-old, dead interested um, on a work experience week, did the events at the school, properly interested. When she got to 16, um, she wound up uh, leaving school and came straight into an ad lib apprenticeship, which is basically a minimum age job, but with a two-year program written by us about where you're going to get to and how you're going to get there. And I think when she first came in, there was, and I don't believe this does exist now, and we're talking probably, how old Laura now? So we're probably talking 14 years ago here. Mm. Um, when Laura first came in, there was a little bit about, what's that little girl doing that? You know, yeah. and, and it, it was a bit sort of, you know, it was a bit standoffish, but she was the first in the truck. She was, the, she was working harder than anybody else. And in the end, because of the nature of the people I think we've got, she wound up with a huge band of brothers who... You know, Adora, work, I've worked closely with her. Um, now, Laura wound up going freelance when, after about five or six years uh, of working at Adlib, because she was offered a world tour with Emily Sandy, I think it was at the time, wow. uh, doing monitors for Emily. Uh, and they didn't want any company associated. Affiliate. So, yeah, But to be fair to Laura, you know, she was happy to stay and had the conversation with me about should I go and do that, but they need absolutely go and do it it's you and since then she's toured the world numerous times with numerous artists um you know and there's lots of stories like that um laurie another young girl who started with us she's been with us and still is with us she's now doing monitors for ellie goulding um you've got uh billy bryson who's a, a young kid again who came to us at uh, 14 um and he wound up uh doing work experience at 14 uh, and then, uh, again, 16, as soon as he could leave, joined us. By 23, he's now one of our senior techs. Again, been around Europe that many times. Jay Pets. There's numerous, mate. There's so many of them. And that was going back to the question you said before. Uh, going back to the question you said before about um, what is it you get the most um, enjoyment from? It's just watching these careers grow. And then you've got others who've been, you know, who yeah. so Phil Stoker, who's a director, Dave Jones, who's a director. These were like, Kids at 18, 19, starting with the company, you know. Um, so uh, there's a history of people who are in their 40s at Adlib who have been there since they were 18 and 19. Um, and, yeah, that's, uh, that is incredibly rewarding. Well, I'm guessing the, the, the main thing there is all of them had the right attitude. And I, I think that's 
one of the most important things of, you know, you, you can teach anybody anything as long as they've got the attitude to want to do it and that, that, that passion and drive. I think that's, that is it. If you haven't got that, then go and do something else. You're not going to enjoy it. You've got to have the passion. You've got to have the drive and the desire and the learning and the wanting. And like I said in the statements earlier, really, it's not just about your technical ability in this and what you know. It's about very much who you are. You know, and again, there's another group of people who roll, you know, Richie Nick, again, another guy who started at Gattaca Comp with us, who's now a client manager, to watch him develop from a 19-year-old and 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 Lindsay, uh, his missus, who's been with us from, again, the same time, um, yeah, and, and watch how she evolved through various different roles within the company and how she moved and the company moved with it. It is, it's, it's, it is really, really good. Yeah. Let's go... Let's go back and have a quick look at the questions. Uh, Peter Heath asked an interesting question. Has We Make Events and COVID brought competitors together and in what way? Uh, definitely has, yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, we all fight and we all uh, for, for certain jobs, certain contracts yeah. and so on and so forth. But I think in this, we all realise that it's pretty much one out, all out, as much as anything else. You know, it's, it's, it is a fight. And the bonding of, of, and like I said, you know, the amount of people I've met on We Make Events uh, who I would never have met is great. But there's also a group of people on this who we've always been sociable with um, that I've been, you know, incredibly impressed with who are, you know, managing directors of other companies or big players in other organisations who have been, you know, a phenomenal part of the fight that we're having at the minute. You know, people like John Penn, who, rarely speaking, you know, John doesn't need to be as active as he has been these days but he has and that's great and it's for the greater good of all of us you yeah. know so i think you know there's not one negative that I've, I've heard of anyone talking badly about anyone at this moment in time um when we come out of it it might get a little bit more interesting but, <laughs> but um between now and that point i've got to say that the camaraderie in this in the industry has been phenomenal yeah I mean, obviously, we, we will go back to competing with each other for, for work. It, it, it's inevitable. But I do think that, you know, heaven forbid anything happens like this again, that, you know, as an industry, we are a lot closer now and should be able to come together a lot quicker and deal with these kind of things. Mm. Um, and Andrew Bishop asks about, uh turn into politics is always always interesting yep. um how do you feel about the northern powerhouse and the way boris is handling our sector what oh. northern powerhouse it's a word from all i can work out I, I i haven't seen what it's meant it's just a title to use from what i can see the handling of our sector um my take on that is the handling of the freelancers and the whether it's the limited, sole limited company or whatever it is, has been nothing short of atrocious. Um, my personal take on that is that anyone, they should have all been paid out the same way as anyone under a company furlough. My problem with it is, is that the governments have looked at how those people have paid taxes and thought, okay, maybe they haven't contributed as much as people pay in NI uh, around X, Y, or Z. That's not their fault that those rules are in place for them to be able to um, take advantage of the rules and regulations that are in place. Any human being is going to do that. So you cannot be penalised for the laws that are currently in place. So you need to pay out everybody in exactly the same way. And this has been government after government after government. You can't just pin that on, on any one government. But the rules of dividends and how that works has always been there. So... You can't, you know, you can't penalise what people get based on what that is. So my opinion is that everyone in the freelance world should have been paid out in exactly the same way as the furlough world. And when this is all over, they should then go and redress how the taxations are paid so it works out fairer. Yeah. You know, in a lot of cases, it isn't actually that different, um, but it's just the way that it's actually billed. So I, I just think it's been handled badly from that point of view. I think the other handling of it, which is, um, I think, incredibly frustrating, is that more often than not, um, the government have done some pretty good things, 
but it's always been that late that it's too late. And I, I get the, you, you feel like none of these people have ever actually run a business. They're, they're sort of sitting there going, oh, we should do this. Well, maybe let's just see what happens. We need to plan. We need to know. Yeah. And if the government aren't, you know, it's like all of a sudden it waits till a load of stuff's gone wrong and then goes, oh, well, we'll make furlough right now. Yeah, but you've just lost X amount of, you know, employees. If you just said that then, you, this wouldn't have happened. So I think... The timing of things has been appalling. Their uh, ability to be able to liaise with businesses and give them a clearer picture earlier to plan, I think, has been poor. Um, mm. And the handling of freelancers and the excluded people has been pretty sh shocking, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, question from Keith. Uh, Andy, what's your best guess on the return of the 2021 festivals? And what threat could we be facing from a European competition? Uh, okay, so I'd love Glastonbury to happen, but yeah. I think um, that will, I think, as much depend around insurances as it does around testing and vaccines, because if the show isn't going to be insured, it's not going to be booked. So yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it goes back to the comments I made before around insurances. So if the show is insured, I think there's a good chance on the you know, government COVID backed support insurance if that happens there's a good chance that uh glastonbury will happen if that happens it's the catalyst i think for all the other festivals happening whether yeah, it's almost, almost like a domino effect i think yeah, it, whether all the other european festivals happen or not I, I i really don't know at this moment in time um because i think that i'll i'll move from um uh, country to country potentially um regarding um um what was it a bit Brett, not brexit it was well, it, about about European um, competitors coming in. So I, I suppose right. Brexit is another one. That obviously, you know, well, my, my thing on that coming is, from Europe and yeah, to I mean, the UK. Do we think they will still do that now, or is it going to be harder? Well, I actually think it's twofold. I think first of all, with a no deal, and depending on how that pans out. Um, those those who are old enough out there to remember what carne is, um, we're going to be going back to stuff like that. So for those who, because I can't see who's on the call from where I am, by the way, I just see Phil's lovely face. Um, so uh, you know, I'm, for those I'm who aren't aware, aware, a carne, carne. <laughs> <laughs> a carne is a document that has every item that of you are touring on it, with every serial number, with make of origin and value for every single item. So one truck could have 20,000 items on it, multiply that by the amount of trucks, blah, blah, blah. So the documentation preparation is immense. That can go through customs and has to be checked at any given moment in time. Um, and the fees that sit around that and then moving across the borders, I don't believe the service industry has been considered at all within the um, government sort of import, export, everything's import, export, import, export. What about service industries in Europe? I don't really think that's been thought about a great deal. And the problem we're going to have is that, you know, the reason the UK is so successful and regarded as one of the best in the world is why the US bands who aren't touring their full production worldwide and the Canadian bands and the Australian bands, when they come over to this hemisphere and onto this continent, they will use UK production houses to go around the whole of Europe, Russia and everything else. If that becomes too difficult, you know, many, many years ago, there were no European companies capable of delivering those jobs. Mm. There are now. And they actually speak better English than most of what we does anyway. Um, so consequently, um, I think that we could lose a lot of mainland European tours to some of the European providers. That would then go hand in hand with potential European companies coming doing more festival work over here because they've been supported better by their governments than our sector has. So with that additional strength moving forward, um, you know, and companies potentially going by the wayside, I can also envisage more of our festivals potentially being delivered uh, and our productions potentially being delivered by some of the European companies. Yeah. Um, Deep let's joy. Go... <laughs> let's go to... I said I wanted to keep this light. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'll have drink. That'll do. I'm going to go to a light question. Here we go. So Jax is saying, uh, "What's the craziest thing that's happened to you whilst mixing a band, good or bad?" There we go. Let, let, let's get it back to some light and memorable. And now you're thinking, oh, my. I can't answer that. Uh, well, I can, but I can't. Um, <laughs> do, do you need to get the solicitors on board first? I please? might do. Um, the nossiest thing that's happened to me. Um, not really many stories. I can tell one of the most stupid things I ever did, um, which was um, there used to be these surprise gigs at Liverpool University where there was the main Mountford Hall, but to the side of the Mountford Hall was a big, long bar that held about 600 punters. And every Saturday night was an unknown band, but always quite a famous unknown band, and it was never known who. So back in the day, it might have been James as they were going, or the Charlatans and all that. So the 89, 90s I'm talking about. So the band I mentioned earlier, the real people were playing, and I had a big old court rig in there, far, far too much for the room. Um, but the PA and everything else was on the other side of this fire curtain. So the stage was on the other side of the fire curtain, as was the PA. And I always, and to this, you know, to this very day, I always got nervous before the band went on stage. And I always, because back in those days as well, it was like more often than not, from sound to a gig, half the PA fell apart anyway, an amp would blow up, there'd be somebody standing behind it, blowing all the air away or whatever it would be, trying to get the things to cool down because they'd overheated. All kinds of nonsense going on. So I always had this little habit of just getting the vocal mic just before the band went on, turning the system on and just getting it to, so people couldn't hear it, but you're listening for it, just feed back a little bit. So I go, yeah, everything's on and up and working, that's fine. Good, good, good. Dead nervous, rooms pack it, packed, hometown gig for the real people again, a really low roof. And uh, they're just about to go on and I'm getting nervous and I've opened up the PA again and I'm just pushing this fader, pushing this fader. Nothing, absolutely nothing beginning to really kick myself <laughs> what's going on next minute out the back of the building running around one of the roadies from the again a proper old-fashioned roadie you know yeah guitar and um, <laughs> and basically just went uh, uh my ears are bleeding what's going on what i'd obviously forgotten dead obvious is that i've got this huge great acoustic wall in front of me i've opened the pa up it's gone straight from the pa hit the wall hit the microphone the feedback behind the thing was absolutely ridiculous the band go on the thing comes up and what I'd actually managed to do, I just thought, it's so full, it's incredibly dull. What I'd actually managed to do was just before the band had gone on, actually fry at least eight compression drivers. And I was running the show on about six a side or something daft like that. And there's me thinking, oh, it's, it's a bit duller in here than it was during the sound show. <laughs> so that was probably the most stupid thing I'd ever done, uh, which was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um. I, I have the most random question I think I've ever seen on one of these from Dave Jones. <laughs> who, which obviously you've, you've got an inkling of what this is going to be. I don't actually, but it's just because it's Jonesy. Go on. What was Brown Bertha and why did you have a flight case called Arthur? Okay, so Bertha was the first seven-ton truck we had, and its registration number was OKA37S. So that was, when I say seven-ton truck, back in the day, you would look to just fill it. So seven was probably 12, because we didn't even know it had a weight limit on it back then. <laughs> so that was Bertha. And Arthur was a small, thin, silver case like this. And back again, back in the day, you just, if something fitted in a case, you just put it in. So every mic stand we owned went in this case. And it was called Arthur because when you went to lift it up, it would be like, Arthur, fuck's sake, because it was so heavy. So Arthur and Bertha were um, two pet names for bits of gear back in the day. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, we got, oh, we got, we got two minutes left. I can't well, believe that's gone that, that fast. Uh, I'm going to go with... Gavin's question, and I'm, I apologise to those of you that have asked asked questions and we've run out of time. Um, but this, this is a great question to finish on. Dead or alive, whose gig would you most like to see? I wouldn't like to go and see Dead or Alive. Um, <laughs> dead or Alive, whose gig would I most like to go and see? Uh, uh, 
we did the, the one of the best things that one of the big parts of the growth of AdLib was um, we got the Bowie reality tour in 2003. And that was a bit special um, yeah. going to that. Um, and I've, I've actually got more sometimes of doing gigs with 50 people in, in a small venue um, that, you know, if there's just a moment in time for you, uh, I, I struggle going to gigs these days. Um, I, I struggle listening to music these days. I mean, all my life I've sat there while I was mixing, taking a whole load of component parts and hopefully turning it into something that people would recognise as a song. And these days, all I hear is the component parts. I don't hear songs anymore. Yeah. So regarding listening to, uh, going to actually actively listen to bands or music, uh, I, I struggle a little bit with that. I'd, I'd say probably Bowie because I wasn't necessarily a massive Bowie fan at the time until I went to one of the shows. Um, and the, the man's charisma was just... Incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Go on. One last question from from an anonymous attendee, which which I love, because they're asking this question, but obviously not going to put their name. So, how did you get the nickname the Big H? That'll either be Mister Lecky, or uh, or yeah. So I can tell you the story behind this. Um, so this is an awkward story to tell. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, so what happened? What happened was back in the day, we used to. So this was like there's like three or four of us with a truck, a gear, and we used to do. Is this uh, your wife laughing in the background? Yeah, she's in the I background. Think. Yeah, brilliant. So back in the day, we used to do lots of small venues and rock gigs and stuff like that, and we had a few scenes because it was just a small crew of you know, and the camaraderie was amazing. And um, we used to have a few sayings, um, which are maybe slightly rude, but I will, in, in the context of this conversation, I'll say it. So at the, at, the end, at the end of the night, it would be something like someone's going for the money, or whatever it was, wherever we were, because everything was cash then. So someone was going for the money, and there'd be another one where somebody just come along and go PTP. And we would all knew what that meant was, which was pussy takes precedence. So if someone had copped during the gig, they were off over there, and the rest of us were getting the gear out. We were young. <laughs> um, so there's this other one. There's this other one where there's this girl who I really fancied for a long, long time. And um, it, it, your, your no, wife does know this story, doesn't she? She does know this story, yeah, yeah. Know just, this just this the story. Just checking. Just checking. So this, this, this had gone on for a while, and she was a manager of a band, and she was in the and she was absolutely lovely. And I've been trying for anyway. This one particular night, she'd agreed to go out, and I was staying over at her place and all that kind of stuff, and. Obviously, boys camaraderie and all that kind of stuff the following day with the rest of the lads. Like, so did you? So did you? Like, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. It just didn't happen. And then they went, you're big. And from that point, I was called the big H. So as politically incorrect as that story is, you asked me the question. I do apologise. But that's where the big H came from. So for those of you who didn't think I was going to tell that story, I did. <laughs> Andy, I have to say, it, it's been brilliant having a chat with you i mean i've had such a laugh cheers i would have believed it eh? a lampy and an ex sound engineer and neither of us have gone to catering yet amazing <laughs> we haven't had a bus stop we haven't had an argument <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've not been up the top of a telescope while you're blasting out pink noise it's, it's been great yeah all good fun mate thank you so much for that pal you're welcome you're welcome before we all disappear, I just want to say we've got some more fireside chats coming up on Tuesday, the 22nd. We've got Robin Ellis of Unusual Rigging and Nikki Greet of Plaza, and they're going to be talking about Robin's career and all things to do with rigging. We've then got Tuesday, the 29th, we've got Kevin Eld talks with us in a very rare appearance talking about his life from Leicester to L.A., uh, where he started at 16 years old as a stagehand in Leicester's Haymarket and is head of creative entertainment at Walt Disney. Uh, on the Wednesday the 30th, we've got production stage manager Emma Reynolds-Taylor of Library Productions talking about her career highlights. Uh, on Tuesday the 5th, I'm then back to talk to Colin Norfield about his 50 years of uh, sound mixing in the industry uh, and just 
having a quick chat with Colin about that, some of the bands that he's worked with, if I read out all of them, that would take up the hour just there. Uh, on Thursday the 7th, we've got our final fireside chat, and we're going to be speaking to some of the team of the uh, steering committee of We Make Events talking about the last nine months, how We Make Events started, all the work that we've been doing both in the public eye and behind the scenes and the future of We Make Events. So if you go to the chat, there's all the links if you want to register for those. Again, have a look at the website, wemakeevents.com, loads of information on there and loads of other events happening in the speakeasy. Um, again, thank you, Andy. It's been an absolute yeah, sure. pleasure, mate. I, I dare say I will see you on another Zoom in a, probably a matter of hours. No. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, mate. <laughs> how, many, how many Zooms me and you will end up in attending. Um, and thank you again, John, from Curtain Call for hosting this for us and doing all the back-end uh, wizardry that, to make it all happen. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, and we will speak to you soon. Cheers. Cheers, bye -bye. John. Cheers Bill. Thank you.